So uh, I'll go through these slides uh, fairly quickly and uh, then we can get on to uh, the discussion. Um, I've got one uh, intro and I think the slides will be available afterwards. That, that's correct, isn't it, Pete? Yes. Um, so if you see numbers or something that uh, you want to have another look at, uh, don't worry too much about that. I'll leave these with Pete and uh, um, they can, uh, you, can, you can look at them at any other time. So I've got an introductory slide which is in front of you. Um, I'm then going to uh, talk about the impact of the coronavirus on the oil industry internationally. I'm going to say a few things about my, what might happen from here and make some points about producer nations, of which, of course, uh, Scotland is one. So uh, the point of this uh, introductory slide is just to give some sort of context to uh, the conversation. Um, as a quotation, one of many such uh, that we've heard in the last uh, few weeks, um, uh, by this is the director of the Berlin Museum of Natural History, but uh, there are many others uh, who said similar things, uh, saying that it's our arrogant relationship with nature which is fueling and even causing many of humanity's greatest uh, challenges, and that the threats we face are interrelated. Um, I accept and agree with that, and I think it's really important if we're talking about. Uh, the coronavirus and how it relates to climate change to see this as a continuum of uh, crises at the bottom of which is the distortion uh, in the relationship between humanity and um, the natural world in which we live. Uh, what I would say is not stressed by the uh, Johannes Vogel uh, and also many other commentators, is that humanity, in fact, um, makes that impact on the natural world as a divided uh, humanity. This is, not a, this is not something coming from, as some commentators say, all of us. This is coming from a society uh, which is divided, a society which is divided by class, a society which is divided by uh, neo-imperialist relationships uh, between nations but it is the workings of that society and that global economy which is causing impact in so if in the case of coronavirus through the whole history of, of, of farming and uh, the relationship of our species with other species or uh, through climate change in terms of the uh, ever mounting uh, emission of greenhouse gases uh, which is caused primarily by uh, fossil fuel consumption. So I think we need to just think of these things as a continuum. Um, and also uh, when I'm going around on my walks or having uh, Zoom conversations with people, uh, you hear people talking about when this uh, coronavirus emergency is over. And I think, first of all, I think it won't be over for a long time because they have to, it won't be over until a vaccine is found. But I think more to the point is that it's one of a series of crises uh, in this uh, relationship between the global economy and the natural world. And uh, so it won't be over in that sense either because it'll tip over and relate to uh, future uh, crises. So that's just a, uh, really to set the scene. Now, um, the next uh, point of this is what has the uh, coronavirus uh, crisis done to uh, the international oil market uh, and to the oil industry? Um, and the answer is that in April, uh, oil demand was essentially down on a global level by one third. That's an enormous amount. Um, Oil is mainly used for transport, and so the uh, demand for oil has been significantly harder hit than the demand for other fossil fuels, coal and gas, uh, which are primarily uh, used for industry or for power stations uh, to generate uh, electricity. Because, of course, uh, the effect of the uh, coronavirus epidemic has been to, has been. Um, strongest, if you like, in, in terms of the economy, it's been strongest on uh, transport. Um, 
the uh, output cuts that were agreed by uh, the OPEC plus group, that's essentially uh, the group of producing, oil producing nations that's dominated by Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia, um, they, agreed in, they agreed at the beginning of this month uh, on about 10 million uh, barrels a day of cuts in output. But uh, the, um, the fall in demand is much larger than that. Uh, it's been a, a fall of about uh, 30 million uh, barrels a day. Um, I've just put a graph on that slide showing what happened in the last, after the last global economic recession and the way that oil uh, demand recovered very quickly. And I'll go on and talk about whether I think that's going to happen uh, this time. And I'll, well, I'll, I'll give you a quick uh, preview. The answer is that I don't know and nobody knows. It could go either way. Uh, but I will come back to that point about the recovery. But before doing that, let's look a little more at this uh, impact of, of um, the coronavirus pandemic on demand. Uh, this is really enormous by any kind of historical uh, standard. And uh, I, I mean, in a way, these slides are a little bit uh, out of date in the sense that I think I, I, I gave a similar presentation to a group of NGOs a couple of weeks ago. And I think there was still a question in our minds at that time as to whether this was demand that had caused the price to fall or was it about uh, what was happening on the supply side and this um, difficulty that the nations uh, in the OPEC plus group had had in coming to an agreement between themselves about how to cut output. What the graph shows is that uh, they failed to reach agreement and the price went down and then they had the meeting with the G20 nations and reached agreement and the reaction to that was the price continued to go down. Um, now what you see at the very on the very right hand side of this graph, I hope you can see it, um, oops is uh, just go back to that, uh, on the very right hand side of this graph you see that the price has in the last week or two uh, recovered a little bit um, and that's because uh, the market has reacted to the Chinese economy uh, coming out of uh, the period of lockdown and uh, Chinese industry restarting and quite a bit of transport restarting in China and uh, the, uh, the, the oil traders and the oil companies are reacting to that and, and the price has come back a bit. But this, this was such a sharp fall in price that nothing that the OPEC plus group could do um, managed to uh, break it or slow it down in any way. And just to illustrate just a bit further this point about the effect of the epidemic on demand, these are graphs uh, were uh, published in the Financial Times um, which show um, the transport in the last week of March, the, amount, the, the level of car transport in some of the world's largest cities compared to the same week the year before. So if you look at the top, uh, the, the first one, Paris, uh, those little um, pink uh, hills uh, just creeping above zero, that's the level of traffic in Paris uh, in uh, the week in question. and those grey mountains uh, are the uh, same week of the previous year um, and you can see so Saturday and Sunday obviously there's less traffic uh, it goes down a bit but uh, the traffic in Paris uh, in the last week of March this year is something like a tenth or whatever of uh, the level that it was at for the previous year and, and just below that is London uh, with um, not much uh, more traffic, uh, but a little, perhaps reflecting the difference between uh, the French uh, lockdown and the, uh, the so-called lockdown uh, that we've had in England. Um, uh, the International Energy Agency uh, uh, estimated at the end of March that globally road transport was 50% down year on year during the first three months of the year. And globally, and this, this then goes back into car manufacture. Uh, th this is a, a big uh, economic slump which is being caused by this 
uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic. Um, and car manufacture uh, looks like it will be 20% lower uh, than last year. And, and, and don't forget, I mean, all these businesses uh, spend fantastic amounts of time uh, worrying about, you know, a one or two percent growth or decline in, in, in their business. 20% decline in, in uh, car manufacture. Um, this is telling me my internet connection's unstable. Can you hear me okay? Pete? Yeah, you're yeah. fine. You're fine. Yeah, okay, on we go. Um, this is another uh, aspect of the uh, impact of uh, uh, lower demand. The IEA, the International Energy Agency, is saying that the total of flights um, in April was down about 60% year on year. Uh, there's some more figures there. D uh, daily international flights down by 87%. Uh, more than 60% of commercial aircraft grounded. Uh, Delta Airlines losing uh, $60 million a day. And again, that feeds back into the aerospace industry. Boeing has cut production by one third. Um, and the other thing is that it feeds back into uh, just-in-time supply chains, which are a really important uh, part of the world economy, a uh, really important aspect of the world economy as it functions now, um, designed for low-cost efficiency, but not for sustainability. And those uh, just-in-time supply chains have also been disrupted by this enormous uh, disruption to transport. Um, so this is really a crisis which completely leaves uh, the crisis of 2008-9 uh, in the shade, not only for transport, but also for manufacturing and other uh, aspects of the economy. Um, so just to add one point to that is that in that same IEA report, um, it, it was uh, estimated that electricity demand uh, has also fallen sharply in the countries in full lockdown by about 20%. And the IEA thinks that electricity demand will be uh, down 5% for the whole year. That's not so relevant to oil, but it's relevant to the other fossil fuels, uh, coal and gas. Um, in fact, the IEA said that certainly temporarily, that is helping renewables slightly uh, against uh, coal and gas. So that actually takes us neatly on to the next part of this, which is what, what might happen next. Um, and uh, what, what this slide shows is, first of all, um, uh, what might happen in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Carbon Brief, which is an excellent uh, source for this kind of thing, um, estimates that uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are likely to fall by about 2 billion tonnes of carbon uh, dioxide equivalent uh, this year, which is about 5%. There's an enormous fall, the biggest fall in any year ever recorded. Um, but the point uh, they have made is that um, emissions would need to fall uh, by more than that, by about 7.5% every year this decade, um, if uh, the target which has been set by the uh, international climate talks of uh, getting to one and a half uh, limiting global warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial temperatures uh, was to be met. Um, so even this gigantic uh, fall this year, um, which has been caused by this enormous economic recession, um, would have to be repeated year on year, more than repeated. Now the IEA actually, which is, and I think it's probably a more accurate figure, they had more data say that uh, greenhouse gas emissions could well be down by 8% uh, this year. But of course, uh, the crucial question about what happens next is, is that going to be repeated in future years? Or is the tendency of the world capitalist economy to bounce back from the crises that it creates uh, it going to prevail? And even the IEA says, quote, it's likely that emissions will rebound, will rebound as economic conditions improve, unquote, and that, quote, the rebound in emissions may be larger than the decline. So that just as in, uh, I showed you on the previous slide, that after the 2008-9 crisis, the 
uh, rebound in emission in uh, fossil fuel use and in emissions from fossil fuel use uh, took rapidly took the total uh, above what it had been in 2006 and seven that uh, the IEA is saying that that is very possible um, in uh, the current situation. Now, uh, I, I said before that I think it, it, it's really impossible to know about some of this stuff. You will all probably, as I have, read uh, articles on the internet saying, you know, it's wonderful, we're all walk walking around, usually walking around first world cities, uh, and, uh, you know, breathing the air and seeing the birds on the trees and so on and so on. And, you know, that can, uh, we, we mustn't go back to what it was before. And it's, uh, you know, this is now going to prevail. And then you get a series of opposite articles saying that, uh, emphasizing that uh, capitalism's ability to bounce back uh, is going to be the crucial thing. Um, I think there are, I would basically come down on, on uh, with the second of those groups. I think that capitalism's ability and need to bounce back is what's going to count. But I think we, uh, there are some caveats to that and I think it is complicated. So first of all, I think that the travel restrictions and other changes caused by the lockdown will, aff will affect uh, demand for oil for a very long time. Uh, I think the aviation industry is clearly in serious, serious trouble. And uh, no matter how governments try to bail it out, I suspect it will be many years uh, before uh, air travel goes back to what it was. I, I mean, I'm, I'm forming my opinions on the basis of reading uh, the press that business people read and uh, the, the, the reports that are compiled uh, by their, uh, if you like, establishment economists. Um, of course, um, there are um, there there are counter uh, there are the fa there are factors which go uh, counter to that. So, cheap oil, for example, uh, could stimulate demand uh, for oil products. And uh, one of the reports uh, that was done by a bunch of economists. Um, it's it's a good report and it's if you if you're interested in that stuff it's worth reading it's from the uh, Smith School at Oxford and Stiglitz and uh, I think Piketty uh, no Stiglitz and Nicholas Stern are among the authors uh, it's called will COVID-19 fiscal recovery packages accelerate or retard progress on climate change they also conclude that they don't really know but what they also point out an example they give which I think is is very relevant is that cheap oil can stimulate demand for oil and they draw attention to something which is certainly going on in the car industry which is that all the environmentalists are talking about uh, electric vehicles and uh, all the uh, not all but many of the consumers in rich countries are now going out and buying uh, sports utility vehicles at unprecedented rates so, and if you have cheap oil, that's only going to encourage them. Um, my uh, thought about this is that much will depend on governments. If governments direct their stimulus packages away from green investments, uh, because they think that uh, the priority has got to be to uh, create jobs as they would see it, um, and uh, to, to support existing industries, um, the stimulus packages could be uh, really uh, dangerous in terms of uh, tackling climate change. Um, th there's been a th th there's been a, a real attack in the European Union, for example, on the so-called European Green Deal, uh, which is probably the uh, nearest thing that there is in any capitalist country to. Uh, the sort of Green New Deal which is being uh, looked at by social democratic parties um, and there's been an attack on it from uh, the right uh, arguing that um, th the first thing that's got to be done in view of the coronavirus pandemic is to put it in the bin because uh, there's no money uh, for uh, supporting um, the infrastructure shift which will be necessary to uh, make progress on uh, climate policies. Um, and the other, so an, and another example is that uh, just as cheap oil could stimulate 
demand for oil, so cheap coal and gas could stimulate demands for those fuels and could hinder the spread of um, renewables in the electricity generating sector. So it, in a capitalist economy, I really think that this could go uh, either way, but I think that the, in, 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 in many aspects, in many industries, but I also think that uh, what will predominate is capitalism's need to uh, expand, uh, to, ac to accumulate, and um, that, that, that it remains the case that societies, uh, what society needs to do, which is to transform industry, agriculture, urban built environments and transport systems in order to deal with climate change will be way beyond uh, its grasp. Okay, that's a general point. Now, uh, just moving very quickly on uh, to say something again about the oil industry and the impact of uh, this uh, pandemic on the oil industry. Um, international oil companies are slashing investment. They're laying off workers, as, as you in Scotland know, and they're also preparing to swallow small arrivals. And I think it's, uh, this is also uh, one of these uh, countervailing tendencies um, that we should be looking at rather than just assuming that uh, the cut in uh, oil demand and the cut in oil supply uh, is going to go on forever. And what we're seeing in uh, the United States is that these small uh, producers which, are, which uh, borrowed heavily from banks and got the shale production going are going to the wall. Uh, so Whiting Petroleum, which is the largest one in North Dakota, uh, has gone bankrupt. Many others will follow. And I think what's really interesting in the politics of the oil industry in the US is that um, where the uh, American Petroleum Institute, which uh, didn't hesitate to lobby for environmental regulations to be removed on account of the coronavirus pandemic, also lobbied against measures that the small producers had suggested uh, to the government uh, to uh, support the oil price. Um, their only hope really of staying in business was uh, for oil prices to come up again. But of course, the American Petroleum Institute, which represents the large producers, were, were very happy for these small producers to go to the wall. Uh, as uh, the boss of one of them said, quoted on Small blog, they, Exxon and the other international oil companies, prefer all the independents to go bankrupt and they will pick up the scraps. And I direct your attention to a, a very good blog post by Adam Hania, uh, who's written on the oil industry in the Middle East, uh, from a socialist standpoint. Um, and uh, as he says, and I agree, we face the very real danger of an emboldened and resurgent oil industry positioned ever more centrally within our political and economic systems. Such an eventuality would be a disastrous outcome to the current pandemic. And he's, he's writing precisely about these large oil companies uh, swallowing uh, the small ones and carrying on. Um, Okay, a quick uh, couple of point slides about the impact on producer nations. Um, this is just a graph from a Nigerian newspaper uh, showing the uh, fiscal break-even price. That's the price at which the nation's government says uh, it can balance its budget. Um, and you'll see there that uh, Russia's uh, around 40 odd uh, dollars a barrel. Well, we're nowhere near that. Uh, but And of course, what Russia was relying on in the argument with Saudi Arabia was that while its uh, fiscal break even is around $40 a barrel, Saudi Arabia's is about twice that, and Iran's is about four times that. And so uh, from the Russian point of view, uh, they, they didn't contemplate the sort of demand cut we've seen. Uh, they contemplated a uh, price war with uh, the other producer nations, but that um, has not come to pass. What they've had is a, is a price collapse, uh, which is uh, affecting all these uh, producer nations. And of course, uh, it will affect the uh, producer nations in the global south. Uh, much uh, The effect there will be much uh, harsher than uh, the effect on the richer countries in the Middle East and, for example, on uh, Russia. 
So Nigeria, uh, for example, has made budget cuts, devalued its currency, uh, it, considering uh, junking petrol subsidies on which millions of people who have to drive in order to work uh, rely and uh, is looking for billions in emergency loans. And another uh, likely uh, victim of this whole process uh, is the uh, National Oil Company of Mexico, which has entered this crisis already heavily uh, in debt. Um, I've just got one slide uh, on the North Sea, and I, I know for sure there are people on this call who know much more about uh, the details of what's going on there than I do, but the, the impact obviously is, is dramatic. Uh, Oil and Gas UK, 30,000 jobs uh, could be lost over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, lots of projects put on hold and uh, spokesman for Oil and Gas UK, we need government support again. Um, and uh, so uh, to my mind, this raises the whole question of a just transition away from uh, oil and gas. And of course, uh, you uh, have thought a great deal um, about that. So to sum up, um, when and to what extent, okay, we've got visitors, uh, when and to what extent um, oil demand will recover is unclear. Uh, capitalism's tendency to expand aggressively as it emerges from crises uh, is clearer. Uh, some mainstream commentators think that the jolt to the rich world use of cars and airplanes is strong enough that oil demand will never uh, return to the level of 2019. And I think there's something in that, that may be, but uh, the changes to economic structure on a much greater scale would be needed to tackle uh, global warming. Uh, people in oil producing countries outside the rich world will be hard hit by the economic depression and the logic of keep it in the ground has never been uh, stronger. And that's it. Um, thank you very much.